we're going to be looking at a, a video clip that is of the Church of God and Saints of Christ today. That's the church that William S. Crowdy, the founder of Hebrew Islamism, began himself. And this is from a video that they put up about 10 months ago. And it was a celebration of something they called Reestablishment Day. And uh, you can find it at Church of God and Saints of Christ on YouTube. It's got 9,400 views. The title is Sabbath Worship Reestablishment Celebration. And so here they're beginning the festivities off with prayer. This is a Zoom meeting because of COVID stuff. And what we're going to see is um, uh, a lady who's part of uh, this group is going to be talking. And she's going to say, we don't put our trust or hope in men, but we still need to thank William S. Crowdy. That's the man who first received the revelation. Listen to this, and then I'm going to read something. And do we put our trust, nor upon angels do we rely, because, Father, we only rely on you and you alone. On this Sabbath day, and also reestablishment day, we would be in grace if we did not thank you for Prophet William Saunders Crowley. When we think about this prophet, we do rejoice. They do call him a prophet, by the way, as you should notice. Rejoice. We rejoice for his coming, we rejoice for his receiving, and we rejoice for his anointing. We thank you for giving him life. If it had not been for Prophet William Saunders Crowdy, where would we be? Thank you, dear God, for pouring your spirit into him so he could tell us all things we should do. Through you, Lord, he was able to set forth the plan of salvation so that we may follow and have life. Through you, Lord, he was able to set forth the plan of salvation. If you go to Church of God and Saints of Christ, if you go to that uh, their website, well, the, here's the thing, it's, it gets a little tricky. There is more than one Church of God and Saints of Christ website. There has been some splits and division um, since uh, everything went down. So I am at churchofgodandsaintsofchrist.org, and under holidays where it says reestablishment day, and I'm looking at the ancient plan of salvation right now. And so I have it up. But listen to what she says about Crowdy. I don't want to get sidetracked too much. Abundantly. His teachings that came from you are still pertinent and precious in 2020, just as they were over 100 years ago. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hope, for displaying courage, for enduring strength, and showing us agape love through Prophet William Saunders Crowdy. We are forever changed by his steadfastness and nourished by his life's example. We are thankful that somebody on our family tree had the spiritual ear to hear the prophet's call and passed it down from generation to generation. Thus is the reason we are here and we are forever grateful to thee. Lord, we thank you and we ask you that you be, we ask that you be with all the participants on today's program. Set right, aside so every weight that easily of, besets them and allow your spirit to... So you hear clearly a reference for uh, William S. Crowdy. Let's take a look at William S. Crowdy according to the church's uh, website timeline here. Now, again, why am I focusing on this individual? He, this is not a camp that you would see out on the street corner. This is not that kind of group. So this isn't even necessarily a harsh criticism of the Church of God and Saints of Christ. But they're really the main ones who recognize the reality that this was a restoration where prior to that, this revelation had been lost. Because a lot of Hebrews lights today basically try to make it seem like this is something that, um, that was claimed, but it was never not there. You know, whereas it's kind of difficult to explain, but they don't really recognize the innovation, essentially, that Crowdy brought to the table. Um, now, the Church of God and Saints of Christ, they view it, of course, as a restoration. You got to understand, around this time in America, there was a lot of those kinds of movements. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a restorationist movement. That means that they believe the gospel had been lost, and now there's a Latter-day vision uh, with a Latter-day prophet to bring it, 
who is now restoring the gospel in this dispensation. So the truth that had been lost, according to Hebrew Israelites, is the fact that they are Israelites. Now, a lot of Hebrew Israelites today, today they don't just want to they don't want to recognize the reality of of this having a historical birthday, but it does. It's 129 years old. And let's look now. Okay, let's look. I um, I, I just, just want to make sure here. Hey, Google, what's 2021 minus 1892? Hey, Google, what's 2021 minus 1892? 2021 minus 1892 is 129. See, 129th birthday. Because here's their timeline. 1892, the Almighty revealed himself in a dream to William S. Crowdy on September 13th in Guthrie, Oklahoma. What is today? Today is September 13th, 2021. And so we're recognizing the birthday of Hebrewism. This dream served as a blueprint for the religious organization that William S. Crowdy would eventually establish. 1896, Church of God and Saints of Christ was organized and incorporated on November 8th, and Prophet Crowdy established the first tabernacles in Emporia, Lawrence, and Topeka, Kansas. Isn't it wild to think that Hebrewism was born in Oklahoma? 1898, Prophet Crowdy organized the Daughters of Jerusalem and Sisters of Mercy, a charitable auxiliary for the women of the organization. On June 26, at this time, over 23 tabernacles had been organized in the state of Kansas alone. Now, if that, if that number is correct, according to their self-reporting, that means in six years since his vision, there's 23 tabernacles just in Kansas, as they call them, tabernacles. That is significant. 1898, the first Passover memorial was observed in Lawrence, Kansas, in April. By this year, Prophet William S. Crowdy organized several tabernacles outside of the state of Kansas in such places as Missouri, Illinois, and New York in May. Prophet Crowdy moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, making it the organization's first headquarters. In 1901, tabernacles were organized throughout the country, especially in the East and Midwest, converting thousands to our faith. The Tabernacle in Philadelphia has a membership of over a 1,000. 1903, in June, Prophet William S. Crowdy purchased 40 acres in Bellevue, Suffolk, Virginia, which would later serve as the international headquarters for the congregation. Prophet Crowdy also sent an emissary to establish the religious organization in Africa. Shortly after, Tabernacles were established in Cuba and the West Indies. Prophet Crowdy later set up the Union Choir Organization and the Department of Sabbath Schools, and he relocated to Washington, D.C. He seems to be a good organizer and a good leader, and I like that um, he's kind of making things well-rounded, you know? Um, you know, I try to look for the good where I see it. This isn't a day of intense oppression and persecution, and he's able to do all this, plus have some mercy ministries, plus uh, some educational and even artistic elements I respect that. I think we should see the achievement there, even if we see the problems. In 1906, in April at the Passover, the institution of our royal blue and brown uniforms took place in Plainville, New Jersey. The wearing of uniforms during various services was initiated by Prophet Crowdy to eliminate the emphasis on social or economic class. Also, at this Passover, Prophet Crowdy selected Chief Evangelist Joseph W. Crowdy, Evangelist William H. Plummer, Grandfather Abraham, and Elder Calvin S. Skinner, counselors, future leaders of the congregation. Um, now, um, I believe that's right before he dies. I believe he... Yeah, there it is. Okay, 1908. 1908, Chief Joseph W. Crowdy assumes leadership at the demise of Prophet Crowdy in August. Now, this is not going to talk about it. At least I don't think so. But there are several skirmishes in regards to leadership to this specific organization. But really... Notice here, 1919, that's an important date for those who understand Hebrew Israelism as well, because that's when the commandment keepers were founded. The commandment keepers. So the commandment keepers is important because the one Westers later came out of there. So you can look more at this, but I think it's important to let you hear them from your own words. We're not going to get deep into the, the different leadership uh, divisions and factions, and to be honest, I fully don't understand them yet. This is not particularly to just so study this organization, but if you recognize Crowdy's innovation, you end up studying this organization because they're the ones who keep the historical receipts, including uh, some rare pictures. 
Let me show you some rare pictures that I've uncovered in the process of doing all this that you may find, find interesting. Let me see here. And then I'm going to go back to showing some of their, their video. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Some of these pictures are directly from them. Some aren't. So first of all, there is William uh, Crowdy. That's, that is him. That's a pretty common picture that you'll see. That is a pretty high res picture also. That's a pretty high res picture. They say he was a large man. They say he was a big man. And uh, that picture would seem to indicate that. So I don't have the date on all of these, though. But uh, I do have the date on, on, on uh, some things. Now, what am I showing you here? This right here is going to become important as we discuss Guthrie, Oklahoma. I managed to find an old map of Guthrie, Oklahoma, right? So this is Guthrie. This is put together by some some uh, venture company or something. Uh, you can see it there at the top. I think I said it wrong. An insurance company, rather. I don't know why I said that. But it, this is Guthrie. Uh, you see it's right there at the bottom. And this is 18... Now I forget. What is it? 1899. So this map was published only seven years after Crowdy's original vision. So that's a big deal. One of these lots, one of these parcels, because he was a homesteader, Ladies and gentlemen, one of them was his. Let me let me put my face on here. Let me show you, show you guys can see me. One of them was his, though, you know, uh, which is a fascinating thing, right? And uh, he claims that this would be where he received the vision, okay? So I'm going to go back. I want to, I want to get some other pictures to show you. Now, some of these come from the organization. Some of them come from other sources, including newspapers.com, newspapers.com. Dot com. Here is another picture of Crowdy I had never seen prior to uh, this deep dive I did in honor of the birthday of Hebrew Israelism as it turns 129 this year. That's a fascinating picture, though. I thought that one uh, was interesting. That is not a picture uh, you commonly see. I guess now that people know it exists as they look into this, they may. Shout out to the squad, by the way, in the live chat. What's up, Nate2D2? What's up, D New? What's up, Chris Cunningham? What's up, J.R. Wilson? Thanks for the love. What's up, Kali? I believe that's how you pronounce your name. I always have trouble. What's up, Chris? How you doing? And what's up, Christopher? We got a Chris and a Christopher. And now, of course, hey, how you doing, Daryl? So shout out to y'all. Thanks for joining me. We're going to get through as much as we can. So I'm using the birthday of Hebrewism. And, you know, every time I say birthday, I should probably do this. <laughs> the birthday of Hebrewism to discuss the history of it so we understand better. So this is documented so more people can look into this. Okay. Um, here is a uh, from a St. Louis Post Dispatch, some kind of drawing uh, that they had made of Crowdy, and uh, apparently, you know, he first was uh, a soldier, and so you you see that right there. Crowdy studied the Bible while a trooper, and became a preacher. So this is con contemporary art of Crowdy. Um, he was a member of a Baptist congregation prior to that. Okay, Kay Lee. All right, Kay Lee, I got you. Uh, he was a member of a Baptist congregation prior to that. And you can see how some of that carries over. Now, again, everyone, most Hebrewites don't recognize a lot of what I'm talking about. Some some uh, that you meet are aware of it, and some will know more, but they're not as forthcoming. This particular organization talks about it because they're proud of their direct history. But most Hebrewites don't recognize this as the legitimate beginning of the ideology of Hebrew Islamism. Now, look, if you're a Hebrew Israelite and you want to call it something else, you could call it whatever you want. But because they may refer to it as an awakening, but the the fact is, 1892 is the first documented date. If you don't like what I'm saying here, it's from Hebrews Light sources. If you don't like what I'm saying here, show a definitive example of a date earlier than that. And listen, Turner, Prosser, and uh, Vesey aren't going to cut it unless you can find a quote, because I've seen those three men use, and what happens is you guys use them. And all you do is essentially show that they were saying similar things to what the spirituals were saying, which is there's a parallel between our bondage and the Israelite bondage and the Egyptians and the Americans. They never said we are those people. It was a spiritual, metaphorical, symbolic identification. And you, you, you're going you're gonna to have to show something because you're not saying merely that. What's up, BK Apologist? Everybody subscribe to his channel. The man does amazing work, and he's on YouTube. And over here, I'm stuck over in the Facebook ghetto, but it's all right. It's all right. Someone's going to take offense even at that. Um, one of the things that Crowdy instituted was feet washing and the holy kiss. So uh, this is more contemporary art, and it does, uh, uh, it does seem 
that uh, he thought that there's things that were lost in the Bible. Now, to understand, you've got um, the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, Pentecostal denomination, roughly uh, similar to Assemblies of God, perhaps more rural, or, um, you know, if the Assemblies of God is upper middle class, maybe Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee tends to be lower middle class. These are stereotypes, but I love both of those organizations, by the way. I got friends in them, so I don't mean that as a diss. I'm just trying to explain to you. But anyway, Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, they, they do foot washing services. Uh, now, I don't know about the Holy Kiss, but he felt that those things were lost, so he wanted to reinstitute those. Shout out to Barry Spain. How you doing, bro? So I'm just showing some pictures as we celebrate the birthday of Hebrew Israelism. These are rare pictures. I don't think some of them, except for one, have ever been seen by apologists. Okay, these are incredibly rare, unique pictures. And uh, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. I don't believe that's him. That's a that's a different guy that, that I was uh, studying. Hold on. That's not a young crowd. Although that would be dope if it was. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a different guy. My bad. That is not William Crowdy. That's uh, William Christian. It's a different, different gentleman. Okay, here is his um, preaching certificate or certificate of ordination, rather. Um, I have not read this thing yet. If someone would like to read it, because I would like to have it transcribed, and they think they can do it, this is as high res as I have. Now, it's blown up in the screen here, so when you have the file, it would be better. But I would like someone to type this out so we have this. But that's the actual uh, his certificate of ordination there in Oklahoma. Now, I'm going to show you some other things. What's up, Andrea? How are you doing? Good to have you today, uh, Andrea. And a lot of you guys, let me just shout out, Andrea. You guys do such amazing work on uh, social media. You know, I see you're busy with your families and all this other stuff, but you manage to really promote apologetics content online. And I just want to say how much I love and appreciate and respect that. And Andrea, you're definitely one of them. So shout out to all y'all. Okay, so I'm going to show you more stuff. We're going to kind of be going back and forth with multimedia here where I show you some pictures. I read some stuff. Then I play some video. That way you should not get bored at any time. So right now, let me show you some more video. And this is where it gets a little bit longer. Uh, we're going to begin with the birth of Crowdy from the organization itself. This uh, lady is somewhat of a historian and does several pieces on Crowdy that are pretty informative. I actually think she does a great job. Straight compassion, the Lord has been our hope. And in 1847, in the midst of the... Okay, so uh, she, this is where she really first began speaking of Crowdy. Now, this is a day where they celebrate, the Church of God and Saints of Christ celebrate his legacy. They're, they're honoring him with this particular Sabbath service. Um, they don't worship him or anything like that, okay? They don't think he's God, okay? They don't think, to my knowledge, they don't think he's a Messiah, like in a literal sense. However, um, at least this group... But nonetheless, um, I would say a little maybe undue, undue praise for him. But I do appreciate the biographical information that they provide. So this is a two minute and thirty second clip. Let's listen to what she says about Crowdy. She's going to get into his birth. So this is beginning, okay? And she shows some very interesting pictures. I think she did a great job. Again, here we go. Straight to compassion, the Lord has been our hope. And in 1847. In the midst of the institutionalized enslavement of African Americans in the United States of America, a black baby boy was born in Charlotte's Hall, St. Mary's County, Maryland. And like stated in Jeremiah 1 and verse 5, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thy camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So, uh, you know, for us, we kind of say that seems like undue application of Scripture towards Crowdy. But uh, I've heard Pentecostals do something similar to that. So uh, let's continue on. By the way, uh, thank you. Uh, Nate is telling everyone to, to, um, to do the tip jar. And th let me bring up uh, the tip jar so I can see if anyone does it. It's through Streamlabs. Streamlabs.com. And since we don't have a super chat uh, on Facebook, because that's a Google thing, you know, Google owns YouTube. At streamlabs.com slash vocab Malone slash TIP tip. Oh, I must have done something wrong. What's up, Robski? How you doing? Yeah, streamlabs.com slash vocab. Okay, I just uh, spelled it wrong on my own name. Okay, now I'll be able to see uh, if anybody... If anybody donates during the show. All right, continuing on. Now here, this is not the exact plantation that this male child was born unto and raised by his mother, 
Sarah Ann Crowdy, also known as Nellie Henson, and his father Basil. But this can give us an idea of their humble, what their humble conditions may have looked like. These photographs are courtesy of Elder William Burrell, who visited the Surly Plantation in Charlotte Hall, Maryland, where the prophet was born. And at this plantation, similar to where the prophet was born, they restored a cabin where the enslaved lived to demonstrate this historical time period in Maryland. So it is in this humble space that William Crowdy was born and lived with his mother. Here, he was called Wilson and his mother was a cook. He lived in a world where if one was black, one's life was not valued or respected outside of the labor that one could provide to those who ruled the land. Wilson did not easily accept this unnatural situation and resisted. And this is interesting what she's about to say. So you notice she's comparing him to other prophets. So, so far she's compared him to Jeremiah with the call. Now they compare him to Moses. Listen to this. Moses who struck an Egyptian and fled, and fled in the second chapter of Exodus. So did Wilson who struck a white man tormentor and fled in 1863. At the so he's born in 1847, struck a white man in Maryland and then fled. In 1863. So the journey begins. 16, hiding in swamps and the woods until he reached the north where he changed his name to William, joined the United States Army, served in the War of Rebellion, also known as the Civil War from 1863 to 1865, and then as a quartermaster sergeant in the 5th Cavalry from 1867 to 1872. Now, I do not have the time to tell all of the intricate and interesting details, but I want us to see the parallels of this prophet of God's life with biblical prophets of old and how this man, a big black man, formerly enslaved man, was selected by God and elevated through divine experiences to redeem a people who were not even considered fully human. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. The world that William S. Crowdy lived in from 1847 until his death in August 1908 was upside down. Choir. And then the choir actually sings a song. I believe it's called Upside Down. And they do have some uh, talented vocalists as part of their... They pride themselves on that and they even put out some uh, vinyl records and whatnot. You can find some of the stuff on YouTube and different places if you poke around. There's some, some good stuff. Now let's take a look at some websites. Now that you've heard that, I'm going to show you couple places where um, you can look at some of this yourself we're gonna scan scan through some of it okay scan some through some of it. you'll see what I'm saying let me see here all right oh, da, 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 da. okay come on now well that's weird come on now why is it being weird like that it's giving me uh problems Okay. Well, I'll just have to deal with it. I have to be like this. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just getting this lined up so you can see some of this. Again, on this day in 1892 is the first time that we have documented that anyone had the vision, the idea, the inkling that black Americans were actually the true Israelites. And Prophet William S. Crowdy, as he is called, was the first one. Church of God and Saints of Christ website. This one's different, though. This is C-O-G-A-S-O-C dot O-R-G. I believe this is under different leadership than the group we just watched, although I'm, I haven't got that 100% confirmed or figured out. Let's look at what they say about Crowdy, okay? We're going to look at this together. William Saunders Crowdy was born in St. Mary's County, Maryland, on August 8, 11, 1847. At age 16, he joined the United States Army and served the Civil War from 1863 to 1865. He then became a quartermaster sergeant in the 5th Cavalry in 1867. He was discharged in 1872. I mean, uh, honorable, this is honorable stuff so far, right? Um, you know, this is not a, this is someone who's contributed positively to society 
And, uh, and I think we should recognize that even if we see some bad doctrine on the other side of it. We can't lay at the feet of Crowdy necessarily, I don't think, I'm trying to be fair here, Sakari and Watchmen for Israel and GMS is what I'm saying. Now, that idea began with them. So there's a certain level in which this bad doctrine, it gets out of control, right? Maybe he didn't intend for there ever to be a GMS where they say, yeah, we can rape uh, people in the kingdom <laughs> as long as they've hit puberty. I'm sure he didn't uh, intend that to be a case or a reality. Um, but, you know, once you start getting bad doctrine, things like this happen. But again, I don't blame him for GMS, uh, nonetheless. But the idea of Hebrewism does begin with him, right? Okay, so... While in Guthrie, Oklahoma, on Tuesday, September 13th, 1892, in case everyone doesn't know, today's September 13th, the Lord God appeared unto William S. Crowdy in a vision, telling him that he wanted him to redeem Israel out of spiritual and mental bondage. Now, do you think that word redeem is accidentally used? No, it's purposely used because of Deuteronomy 2868. That's important to remember. Everyone should have caught that if they're following these things. Being unaware that he had been chosen by the Most High before his conception and birth as a prophet to the nations. Now notice again, it's to the nations. They don't have the same level of uh, supremacy and racism. They're still ethnocentric, but they don't have, you know, what would come later with ISUPK and IUIC, right? They don't have that exclusive mentality or element, right? Prophet William S. Crowley was frightened by this in subsequent revelations, Jeremiah 1.5, all true prophets of God are called through divine revelation. In Numbers 12, 6, the Lord God declares, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, the, I, the Lord, will make myself uh, known unto him in a vision, will speak to him in a dream. So this is how they justify, partially, what happened, right? So this they're saying this is a work of the Lord, right? So this is not really strictly biography at this point, right? There's uh, essentially what we might call editorializing here. You, got, you guys see what I'm saying? Because they're saying, oh, so a little bit of apologetic element thrown in there uh, in essence. Now let's continue on and take a look at this. Okay, so that's what they're saying. If one would but read the prophets from Abraham through Malachi, one would find consistently through the calling of the prophets by God through dreams and visions. By the way, notice how it ends there with Malachi. Hmm... This particular version of the C-O-G-S-A-S-O-C is Tanakh only. They do not accept Jesus as the Messiah, which is odd to most people because it says, and saints of Christ in their name. But they don't. Some of the other ones do. They don't. Continuing on here. Da, 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 da. And so it was, was the, uh, 1892. The hand of the Lord was upon him and carried him out in the spirit of the Lord and set him down in the midst of the valley, which was full of dry bones. That dry bones, Ezekiel 37 reference, is very important to Hebrew Israelites because they believe they're in a modern day awakening where the bones are no longer going to be dry. They're going to be living. The command was so awakening, said the prophet, that one could not resist its calling. However, he did resist it first because of his family, property, and acreage ties. He promised God that if he gave him one good year, he would go and be a messenger to humanity. Okay. God gave him a good year, and he asked for another year after that and got it. But in 1895, he again asked God for one more good year and promised then to prophesy. That year, his business endeavors failed miserably and his losses were severe. One day, while felling trees, the hand and the spirit of the Lord were heavy upon him. He said, it was like the sound of the rushing birds. He heard a voice telling him to run for his life. Uh, this, is, this is a bit strange. I mean, you could look at the Old Testament and say, well, there's strange stuff there, but it's like God's telling him, hey, you better run, you're, you're going to die. He became disturbed and fled into the woods thinking that he was going to die. That's where you get into, this sounds a little bit like Muhammad's revelations in a cave, maybe? What's going on? What's up, Jose? How you doing, brother? Man, Good to see you, man. But that's that's what he says here. So, again, this is the birthday of Hebrew Islamism, 129 years old. September 13th is where William S. Crowdy, who's called a prophet by the Hebrew Israelites who still follow him, received the vision that we're now talking about, which is, in essence, 
black Americans are Israelites. He became disturbed and fled into the woods, thinking that he was going to die. Like the prophets of old, Prophet William S. Crowdy was experiencing an awesome and dreadful encounter with the divine. As he escaped to the woods, he took an axe and glazed the trees so that in the event of his death, his body might be found. So he's like letting Mark let him know where he is, right? The prophet was at this time going through a great change, and change always begins in conflict. Again, I could do without the editorializing here. I like the just strictly uh, biographical elements, but... You know, they're, they're probably like, if they hear this later, they're like, hey, we're writing our stuff. You know, what business do you have telling us how you, you know? <laughs> okay, let's uh, make sure that I've got all this on here. Huh. I want you guys to be able to see it is all. Huh, it's a bit odd the way it's doing that to me. Well, you might have the edge cut off. Is there, is there a way to avoid that? Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to make sure you guys can see what's on the screen is all. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, but it uh, needs to be bigger, doesn't it, people? Yes, it does. Oh. I think that's as good as it's going to get, okay? That's as good as it's going to get. I'll read it to you, though. You can blow this up later. I know you guys, some of you are on your phone and stuff like that. But continuing on. but It was during his sojourn in the wild that Almighty God revealed to William S. Crowdy the ancient plan of salvation. So this is not something that's clear in the Bible anymore, I guess, it has to be revealed to him as if the gospel is not there. As taught by Moses and the other biblical prophets. So the plan of salvation, you know, Apostle Paul didn't teach it because he's not looking at Apostle Paul as any relevance here, at least this particular branch of the organization. All right. Upon returning to his wife and children, they scarcely knew him, for he had greatly changed in both mannerisms and physical appearance. His hair color had turned completely white during his brief absence, Crowdy. Realizing that he could not put off his mission any further, begin his work in Guthrie. He spent a period of time preaching, converting, and baptizing people in the Guthrie area. He expanded his mission to Texas and other southwestern points, preaching and baptizing as he went. I wonder if he baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. No, he couldn't have. They're not a New Testament organization. But why are they baptizing people then? Baptism is not ever uh, commanded in the Old Testament. It's something that developed as part of Second Temple Judaism, so John the Baptist was doing it. But baptism for people was never commanded in the Old Testament. It was something developed for proselytes to do and to get ritually clean, but not, it wasn't a baptism of repentance for Jews. They had these things called the mikvah baths. Anyways, I'm just working through it. I'm just trying to I wonder what the rationale for the baptism element would be. For these folks. But anyways, continue on here. Da, 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 da. Baptizing as he went. In 1896, the Crowdies moved to Lawrence, Kansas, and the prophet began preaching the word of God. At first on street corners, some things never change. We have had Hebrews lights on our street corners in the United States of America since 1896. That's a long time, man. And uh, we need to have like the an the birth the um the anniversary or celebrating of uh, street preaching by Hebrews light sometime. Anyways, moved to Lawrence, Kansas, and the prophet began preaching the word of God at first on street corners. He organized the first time I at Emporia and the second at Lawrence. Prophet William S. Crowdy, great preacher of righteousness, came in the volume of the book, the Bible, bringing back. To the world, the ancient of days, those same truths which the former prophets had fostered were heralded again by this prophet of God. So notice again, this is a restorationist movement. It's not accidental that during the 1800s, you had Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I'm not even telling you everybody, this is a little bit late in the game, right? They were a little bit earlier. They'll all say, wait, the gospel has been lost. We need to restore it. Scholars call that a restorationist movement. Hebrew proper. 
is a restorationist movement. Notice here, it's explicit. It's less times explicit when you talk to some of the other groups, but they're saying the ancient plan of salvation had been lost, and the reality that, uh, you know, black Americans or the Israelites, that was all lost. Then you also see, this is why some scholars don't call it Hebrew Israelism like a lot of the apologists do. They call it black Israelism, because the initial impetus and even the central thrust still today is black votes equal Israelites. Black Israelism. Hmm. What are the truths lost? The Sabbath, Saturday, the Passover, the Hebrew calendar, the Day of Atonement, and above all, the Ten Commandments of the Sinai Revelation. As he strove to reestablish the doctrine and gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 10, 6, right? You guys still hear that kind of language, don't you? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Uh, he met with much opposition from some of his listeners and from some of the civil authorities. While preaching in the streets, he was arrested 22 times. However, he continued the mission on which he had been sent. The membership was increasing so rapidly in the region that the prophet gained the attention of the major newspapers. They began referring to him as the Black Elijah. He replied, I am not Elijah, but I am come in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now, isn't this interesting? Because what happened later on with round two, if you want to call it that, of Hebrew or Islamism when it began of the one West variety by Abba Bivens, who, who, who preached on the street corners of Harlem. What was said about him by his students? I don't, it's not clear if he ever actually claimed it. What's up, JP Davis? How you doing? What's up, Brandon? How you doing? Check this out. What was said? Abba Bivens was literally John the Baptist reincarnated. That's Tahar still claims that to this very day. Abba Bivens, John the Baptist reincarnated. Did I just say John the Baptist? Wait, man, I'm getting tired. Am I tired? I need an energy drink. So bring me an energy drink. I meant to say Elijah. I think it was a different dude that's John the Baptist. Oh, man, I need to text a boo. That one part, Abba Bivens was said to be Elijah. Okay, that was the point why I was saying that. John the Baptist, I got confused because I was talking about that earlier. Okay, just scratch that. You, hopefully you caught off of what I'm saying. After establishing congregations in three cities in the state of Kansas, Lawrence, Emporia, and Topeka, and ordaining ministers to be in charge, the prophet moved on to Sedalia, Missouri, Chicago, Illinois, and several cities in New York, establishing tabernacles and ordaining an elder in charge in each city before moving from one location to another. Wouldn't it be fascinating to know if there was a connection between, um, you know, Crowdy over here, right? Like, and in and, and like one Westers or something like that later, wouldn't it have to be almost? And this other guy, F.S. Cherry, that's really early that we have way less information about. F.S. Cherry, uh, his, his vision was like in 1896 or something like that. You got to wonder if it was like with the dates were a little different. Did he get it when Cow Crowdy was traveling through New York? I'd have to look at the dates there to line up. Anyways. Um, in May of 1899, Prophet William S. Crowdy moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was in this city that he took up permanent residence for about four years, naming it as the organization's headquarters. By 1901, more than 1,300 members had joined the Philadelphia congregation. Several kinds of businesses were established in that same city, including a general store, barbershop, restaurant, and printing plant. While in Philadelphia, the Prophet convened the first Passovers of our congregation to be held in the East on April 14, 21, 1901. The first Passover was held in Lawrence. Kansas in April 1899. Thousands of saints came from many cities throughout the country to attend the services. Because of the prophet's great success, great success, jealousy began to swell up among many prominent clergymen of many other religious persuasions. It was accused, he was accused by them of anarchy and preaching false doctrine. Probably not on the first charge, but yes, on the second charge. I mean, come on now. All right. I mean, come on now. Just being honest, I'm just saying. Gotta be honest here, even if he seems like a nice guy. In the February 16th, 1900 issue of the Philadelphia Daily Press, no longer published, a detailed article appeared telling of the mass meeting held by those ministers and how they declared that this so-called Negro prophet must be stopped. In a statement to the newspaper, the prophet said, in part, We have got to get this. Philadelphia Daily Press, February 16, 1902. Wouldn't we have to know, wouldn't you love to know? what these pastors in Philly were saying about someone. We got to find this. We got to find this. The more they denounce me, 
the more people pack my services. A oh, little bit of hubris there. I came to this city less than a year ago from Texas and had taken in over 1,300 converts. Oh, he's got the spirit of Jade Iyer there. They are jealous of my success. I teach my people to love one another, keep the Ten Commandments, pay their honest debts, and esteem from alcohol and tobacco. If that's anarchy and false doctrine, I am willing to take a back seat. Mayor Ashbridge has seen my work, and he finds no offense in me. At the Philadelphia congregation continued to grow, the prophet began to ordain many ministers and send them to various cities throughout the United States to establish this noble work and to gather Israel. Gathering of Christ Church, right? Hmm. In 1903, the prophet purchased 40 acres of land for the religious organization at Bellevue, Virginia. In subsequent years, more acreage was purchased by Bishop William H. Plummer. The present international headquarters and the temple is now located in Bellevue. In the year 1905, Prophet William S. Crowdy sent an ambassador to South Africa telling him which tribes... What? Wait. Which tribes? How would he know that? Well, this is interesting. We need to look into this. We need to look into this. I'm going to read this again. I didn't catch this the first time. In the year 1905, Prophet William S. Crowdy sent an ambassador to South Africa telling him which tribes would receive the true gospel. It makes it sound like Crowdy is telling the ambassador, these are the tribes that will receive it, these are the true Israelites or something like that? It's interesting, it's South Africa, isn't it? Hmm. I wonder if this ever got established among the Limba. There are still congregations in Africa, by the way, I've looked into this. Although I don't have all the details, but i got some of the website links in my, in my notes. As a result, tabernacles now exist in Malawi, Swaziland, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Shortly after 1905, branches were established in Cuba and the West Indies and its tributaries. In 1906, in the Passover in Plainville, New Jersey, Prophet William S. Crowdy designated three men as future leaders of the congregation. They were evangelist Joseph W. Crowdy, evangelist William H. Plummer, and Elder Kavanaugh Skinner. Now, the other lists seem to be longer, so I think there's some kind of debate amongst the leadership. This is a common thing. This happened uh, to an extent within Mormonism with Brigham Young. This also happened, of course, in Islam, very famously. In his declining years, the prophet often spoke to God's people about love. One of his most enduring and noteworthy pronouncements was, quote, little children love ye one another. Bro, that's not his pronouncement. That's First John. What is this? Because it still remains timely and applicable to every generation. Could someone look up the exact uh, quote there uh, 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 from First John? Little children love one another. Because uh, it's not crowded. The, what? These guys don't seem to hold of the New Testament. Crowded goes around quoting First John, and then they say it's a memorable pronouncement by him. What? Someone in live chat find First John where it says, "Little children love you one another." I want to know the exact place. Uh, Nate says, Crowdy is like a counterfeit John the Baptist. Let me put this here. Crowdy is like a kind of making straight the way for Hebrew Islam. Yeah, what's up, what's up? Someone find that first John reference for me. If you if you don't, you're not a good audience, and I'm just going to quit quit Facebook. I'm just going to quit it because you guys don't love me, so what's the point? I'm in this ministry by myself. Man, what a ripoff. The accomplishments made by this one man in just 12 short years are incredible. Although still within the shadow of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, the unsung hero of faith, Prophet William S. Crowdy, excelled not only in the field of religion, but also as a businessman, industrialist, musician, grand master of masons. Uh-oh! <laughs> Why did they put that in he also excelled being a grand master of masons. Okay. Author and publisher for the generations who heard and obeyed his God-centered message. The prophet of God has been a, is a hiding place from the wind and a covert from the tempest as rivers of water in a dry place as a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Wait, isn't that talking about Yahweh? <laughs> hey, Chris, thank you, man. I appreciate somebody being on the ball. My little children, let us not love in word, word neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Uh, so, well, is that First John three eighteen? I guess someone could say it's not an exact thing, but I mean, you put it together that that's what it's that's what it's saying. It's just it's weird. He's taking credit. What's it's kind of a summary of First John three eighteen? Unless there's another passage, I knew it was somewhere in First John. 
That's just weird, man. Don't believe in the New Testament. But And look, it looks like he's applying this passage for Yahweh to himself. Anyways, Prophet William S. Crowdy fell asleep on August 4, 1908 in Newark, New Jersey, although his remains are interred at the Sepulchre of the Prophets in Belleville, Virginia. His great teachings will forever be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. See, this is problematic. It literally ends saying his teaching will be a lamp unto our feet and a light. That is what pro- that's what the Bible says about itself. You can't do that, guys. Okay. It looks like the COG ASOC is a little more carried away with some of this ad- adulation, you know. They're there in Virginia, by the way. Suffolk, Virginia. It's a particular one, but... Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Okay, now let us go back to some video. Let's go back to some video here. All right. Yeah, there you go. See, Christopher Cunningham, I give you a new command. Love each other. You must love each other as I have loved you. Hmm. Okay, you guys ready for the next one? Here's the next one. So as the song says, the world was upside down. All right, we're going to continue on now, and I'm going to flip this. It's not letting me flip it. Uh, Okay, well, whatever. Oh, it did let me flip it. Thanks for letting me flip it. All right, let's play play this next part. It's three and a half minutes about Crowdy. This man, a young William S. Crowdy, here pictured around 1880, was making a way in a world that although abolished legally legalized slavery in 1865, continued to systematically and legally oppress, suppress, and dehumanize African Americans. After the end of the Civil War and serving in the army, he moved out to West, he moved out west to Guthrie, Oklahoma, like many African Americans, where he could attain land to sustain himself. There he fell in love married, had children, served as a deacon in a Baptist church, was an ardent mason and worked as a cook. He built his own home and sustained a farm and maintained a farm to support his family. This is a picture of the Oklahoma homestead where the prophet resided. And God had a plan. So, you know, they looked into this. Uh, According to them, this is the actual, his actual homestead. Now, I actually have up here, I'm going to show you guys later. I'm not sure. Well, maybe I should just, should I just show you this now? I have something pretty interesting, okay, that I, um, I was surprised that this was on online. But check this out. Check this out. I'll just show you now because she's only been talking for 54 seconds. We can, we can spare this. Look at what's on the screen here, okay? This is fascinating. So, for for uh, historical research for the state of Oklahoma, they've got these business and resident directories they put online from from yesteryear. So here's one okgenweb.net, all right? And it's actually the 1892. Oh, you can't see it. Let me let me make sure you can see it there. Now you can see it. This is the 1892 Business and Resident Directory for Guthrie, which is in Logan County, Oklahoma. Can you believe it? Looks like the Oklahoma Territorial Museum allowed them to put this up there. So this goes back to real documents, right? September 1st, 1892. Do you know... Do you know how I'm... Let me, let me explain here uh, something real quick. Let me, let me... I gotta look at you guys for this. I gotta talk about this. Let me, let me explain something here. Okay, look at me, look at me. This is interesting. This directory of the residents of Guthrie that I've got up here on the screen, this was, this was published 12 days before he received his revelation. Do, do you see what I'm saying? It's digital, obviously, here, but they're telling you what it's from. I think you could probably go to the Oklahoma Territorial Museum, it looks like, and you could look at it if you had access and all that kind of stuff. 1892, his vision was September 13th, 1892, you know? What's up, Michael? How you doing? Ron Markey, uh, how you doing, bro? So watch this. It's been transcribed by Angela Loy. So let's go to C. See what it does. Is, oh, you can't see 
I've got to get this where you guys can see it. We should be able to. There you go. Now you guys can see it. Now I'm going to make it a little bigger. This, some of this, what I'm doing, I know I'm just a guy on the internet, but some of this has never been done before. Okay. You see what I'm, you see what I'm doing, don't you? Wait. What? I just had it. Oh, no. Yeah. There we go. Okay. So, so see what I'm doing here? So, uh, let me, let me, let me show everyone if, if you can't see what I'm doing here. We're celebrating, uh, marking, you know, I don't know if celebrating is the right word, the birthday of Hebrew Islamism when William S. Crowdy first received a vision in, in September 13th, 1892 in Guthrie, Oklahoma, that uh, black Americans were the true Israelites. Here I have a business directory that has been pu put up by folks in Oklahoma that is the f published September 1st, 1892, so 12 days before he's purported to see his vision. And here you see business and resident. But remember, Crowdy is a homesteader. So you have to go to another section of this. And you can see what I'm trying to do here. If you're, if you're paying attention to the show, you know what I'm about to do. Who are the homesteaders of Logan County at this time? Well, there's all their names. And it tells you the, the place where their land is. Do you see what I'm saying? So you could actually find exactly where he was and line this up if you had some... Uh, surveying, topography, cartography, geography type skills, right? Which I'm not claiming I do, but I could work with someone. We could probably figure this out. But check this out. Crowdy is in here. I got it highlighted. Look, Crowdy. He's right there. Crowdy. W. S. Oh, um, I keep on doing this. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna look at this because uh, I mean, we need to meet some friends with someone in Guthrie, Oklahoma. It's a small little place, uh, but I should do a tour of Hebrewism important sites one day, and I would love to go there. But there it is, there it is. Look at that, Crowdy W S. His name is William Saunders Crowdy. Okay, <laughs> Northwest twenty six fifteen dash one East. That's where it was. Exactly where it was. Isn't that crazy? I, I thought that was amazing when I found that. Okay, so we're we're doing a deep dive here on the birthday. Now, let me bring up this file again and go back and play. So, as the song says, the world was upside down. But this man, a young William S. Crowdy, here pictured around 1880, was making a way in a world that, although abolished legally legalized slavery in 1865, continued to systematically and legally oppress, suppress, and dehumanize African Americans. After the end of the Civil War and serving in the Army, he moved out to West, he moved out west to Guthrie, Oklahoma, like many African Americans, where he could attain land to sustain himself. There he fell in love married, had children, served as a deacon in a Baptist church, was an ardent mason and worked as a cook. He built his own home and sustained a farm and maintained a farm to support his family. This is a picture of the Oklahoma homestead where the prophet resided. And God had a plan. On a Tuesday evening in 1892, in the month of September on the 13th day, the Lord God revealed to William S. Crowdy through a series of dreams and visions telling him to go and redeem my people Israel out of spiritual and mental bondage. God touched the heart, mind, and body of William Crowdy. He would fall into deep sleeps, dreams where he would learn of this great doctrine and way of life. His experience was likened to that found in Numbers 12, verse 6. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. God talked to, preached to, disturbed William S. Crowdy, preparing him with a message grounded in the volume of the book, the Bible. Precept upon precept and line upon line. Here yes, you did just hear her say that. This precept upon precept, misuse, 
literally goes back to Crowdy. I remember to this day when Sam Shamoon, Adam Coleman, Abu Kamar, and a couple brothers from Puerto Rico and the cameraman were all there together in Harlem, right? This is during uh, Christians and apologetics or whatever the Frank Turek thing is, cross examine training. And that took place in Queens. And so we would, or Brooklyn rather, I'm sorry. So we would leave after the training was done and go from Brooklyn and go over to Harlem and that area. And there's a library there with a research center, right? And we were going through these old books, and I took a bunch of pictures and video. I should put some more up today. Uh, we were looking at these copies of books by Crowdy and about Crowdy we had never seen. And you can't check them out. You know, this is like a book that there's one copy of type of thing. But it's there in the library. Schomburg uh, Center or whatever. So we're looking at them, and I remember when I stumbled upon it, it was a highlighted line. I think it might have even been in the front of the book. I got the picture. And it said, precept, precept, there, a little here. And I was like, so we had to be quiet. This is like kind of a serious library. I was like, a boo, a boo, too. And I pointed and I showed him, and he was like, looking at it. I was like, yo, this precept upon precept, it goes... This misuse of this verse goes all the way back to Crowdy. Now, obviously, it goes back to the Bible as far as the text, but not the misuse of it. All right. Continuing on. Little and there a little, as stated in his biography, Life and Works of William S. Crowdy. Published That's the book I was talking about. In 1955. And let me say, if you haven't read this book, it's a must read for 2020. Yeah, but how do you get a hold of it? Everyone can't go. I mean, maybe this group sells some. How do you get a hold of it? That's the thing. I would love to know if someone can find it. Let me know because I had to take pictures of the book. So I have like some images, but I don't have the book, you know. He preached righteousness, fairness, equal pay, respect, and that all lives and black lives matter. But I get ahead of myself because I'm in 1892. So God first revealed himself to William Crowdy that he was his chosen vessel. In 1895, God disturbed him again that he even stated the command was so awakening that one could not resist his call. So in this year of 1895, as William Crowdy was working on his field, clearing his crop, he heard a rushing sound like a great flock of birds and then heard a voice that told him to. By the way, that's the, the uh, woman who was reading. Her name is Khadija O. Miller. Saint Khadija O. Miller. Now this timeline gets a little tricky because now they're saying 1895 is when it appeared when did when was like which one's the revelation it's like the timeline's a little odd you know it's like i really got to set this down and um, look at this but anyways happy birthday 129th hebrew is a listener here we go Run for your life he dropped his axe and he started running through the woods and blazing trees and as he went so that he just knew he was going to die wait a minute if he dropped his axe how can he glaze the trees he dropped his axe and started glazing tree, because the glazing the trees is where he's marking it with an axe. Is he scratching it, or did he pick the axe back up? I'm just, I'm just thinking through this as I hear her say it. He left marks on the trees so that they could find his body, and he ran and he ran and he ran deep into the woods and fell into a deep sleep. Now this is the mighty hand of God for four. Story gets a little weird here, but hey. Four days and four nights. William S. Crowdy was asleep in the woods. No buzzards, no bears, no foxes, no deers, no people, no one and nothing bothered him while the Lord spoke with him and showed him the purity of the church of God and saints of Christ. The ancient plan of salvation, a doctrine based on universal truths, not combined to any religious denomination, but yet firmly grounded in the 10 commandments, seven keys and God's holy word as found in the Bible which William Crowdy was told to eat up, learning and using scripture for instruction as found in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. Well, hold on. I think the female reading is from a different branch than the group we just read about because they seem to be quoting the New Testament. And I don't think all the branches today hold the New Testament anyways. And then he woke up and returned home, a different man in appearance and spirit, never to be the same again, because from the woods, he returned as a man 
of God. Choir. And they sing songs there. Okay, 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 okay. Now let's take a look over here. But Oh, let me look at the Streamlabs. Is anybody... Oh, Streamlabs, where have you... I need to put the graphic back up on the screen, don't I? Stream... Andrea! Andrea did it! Andrea! Andrea, thank you very much for uh, a birthday gift for Hebrewism's birthday or something like that. No, seriously, thank you. You keep us going. Uh, let's let's have a little party. <laughs> thank you, Andrea. So we do have someone who is tipped in the tip jar. Okay, thank you for tipping in the tip jar. Okay, so um, let's let's look at a, a few things here. Okay. Let me look at which thing. I, I got a number of things I'm going to show you here, but. I don't know which one I should show you. Yeah, let me read this other bio because what's interesting is each each website has a little bit different of a bio about him. They emphasize different things and stuff like that. Nothing wrong with that. But it's hard to know if they're even entirely on the same page. This bio is not as helpful, but it does have some different little things I want to point out so let's go here okay 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 let's take a look here this is from the church of god 1931.org website our history a brief resume of some of his work it was in the latter part of the 19th century that there came to the city of Philadelphia a man who was not known or recognized by any of its millions of inhabitants. He was not attired in the latest style of clothing, and of course he was hardly noticed by anyone. No one knew his mission, and no one seemed to care. But while the various denominational churches were carrying on their meetings and indulging in all kinds of sensational revivals, there was a growth of crimes and evil still prevailing in this great city of brotherly love. The Negro churches were appealing for a union among its race, and the one great question before them was, how could this be done? It had been openly declared that no one could lead this obstinate race to success and prosperity. Professor Booker T. Washington of the Great Industrial School at Tuskegee, Alabama, was at the time doing a great work among the Negroes, and he was the idol of a great many and a foe to others who were prejudiced at his great success and his ability to gain the friendship of the leading white citizens of the country. It's strange how much context are given to this bio, right? I'm just saying. The general situation was very perplexing. It looked as though the race would go heedlessly onward without anyone brave and courageous enough to come forth and point out the true way to its salvation. Notice this is the aspect of him redeeming Israel, basically. But the all-wise God who shapes all of our destinies and who gave us our freedom knew that it was time to send unto us one he had promised and he did according to his holy scriptures. They're basically saying that Crowley's birth was prophesied, I guess, here. What's the prophecy he's fulfilling, guys? Tell me. This obscure man whom we have mentioned above came from the far west where he had received information from on high while at work as a cook on the Santa Fe Railroad. Now, it's true that's what he was, but according to the other sources, it wasn't while he was on the railroad. You know, the sentence is a little confusing now. Unless there's a debate about which one it was, it came in the form of vision and the laws which were handed down to him were written in the form of a book according to Revelation 10.10. 10. Notice how they quote the New Testament. The other ones don't. Notice that. What's up, George? How you doing, bro? ex is light in the building. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Did you know about this birthday? 129 years old, man. And I took a little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey, and as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. It was called the Seven Keys, or the Revelation of the Holy Bible. It doesn't make sense how he's getting this. Like, he has the Seven Keys, but the Bible already exists. I mean, but look how they 
portray this. He at once started out on his God-given mission, and he established many churches in the Western states bearing the name of the Church of God and Saints of Christ. The only church that is mentioned in the Bible, according to 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2. The seven keys were the only guide that he gave to the people to go by, which was the plan of salvation. And if they searched the scriptures according to the direction, to its direction, they would not go astray, and their blinding eyes would be open to the marvelous light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay. It's, uh... Oh, man. Okay. I'm getting bogged down in some of this stuff. Come on, folks. After having accomplished this great work in the rest, he turned his head to east and straightway he came to Philadelphia, as we've stated above. Why? This seems to be rewritten a little bit. He commenced his mission on Broad Street, the principal thoroughfare, and each night he could be found delivering his message to hundreds of people who congregated and listened with utter surprise and curiosity as his peculiar teaching. And among his hearers were some of our learned divines, both black and white. His utterances were so difficult to any that they had ever heard as to arouse them to anger, and they could not refrain from interfering and challenging him to a discussion, which only resulted in them departing weaker. (laughs) Sounds like some Hebrew is like trash talk right there, but much wiser as to the revelation of the Holy Scriptures. The wicked flee when none pursue, right? He was declared by many to be crazy, and some thought that he should be placed in jail. According to the other Bible, he was 22 times, but not having committed any crime, the law was helpless, and they could not restrain him from speaking the truth. Hmm. Fascinating stuff, but hold on, hold on, hold on, the real truth, but oh goodness, oh goodness, come on, man, what is this, oh, let's see, you know what, let's, uh, let's continue that, let's, 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 uh, let, I don't want to read any right now anymore, I want to hear this, this video, this is the last video, now this one's longer, so I'm going to have to skip through it, but this is 14 minutes, okay. So yes, <clears throat> as this man of God, calling himself the world's evangelist, began to preach, he could quote the Bible and he touched people's hearts. At first, preaching on street corners and on street corners, and then to hundreds and thousands of people from all walks of life. His sermons were of love, peace, and righteousness. On this mission to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Prophet William Saunders Crowdy strove to reestablish a seemingly strange doctrine that had been lost for centuries. He encouraged folks to see the God in themselves and to live accordingly. His preachings advocated for honest, ethical, and moral living, where folks read and followed the Bible, observed the seventh day Sabbath on Saturday, not Sunday, meaning not to work on Saturday, and devoting the day fully to God learning and obeying the Ten Commandments and demonstrating charity to one another and full surrender to God, that they could live an abundant, prosperous, and peaceful life, a life that truly mattered. Now, let me remind you that this is the late 19th century. What was going on? In 1890, African-Americans were disenfranchised first by the Mississippi Plan and then in subsequent states, including South Carolina, Louisiana, Georgia, Virginia, and Oklahoma. In 1890, you have the formation of the Afro-American League under the leadership of T. Thomas Fortune. You have Booker T. Washington pushing for self-sufficiency through a mutual segregationist plan. And you have W.E.B. Du Bois, Harvard-educated, excuse me, Harvard-educated sociologist sharing the talented 10th idea for leadership and survival for African-Americans who wrote a critical text, The Philadelphia Negro, in 1900. In 1896, Plessy versus Ferguson legalized segregation and supported Jim Crow laws. And from 1890 to 1901, more than 1,200, 1,200 African-Americans were lynched that are documented, which averaged about 100 murders per year. And this is only what was captured. There were most likely many, many more. It is also during this time that you have the development of additional national black organizations like the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs in 1896 and the National Afro-American Council in 1898. 1898, the National Baptist Convention organized in 1895, and you have a plethora of African Americans demonstrating their talents. Some are first and some are multiples of many. Trained doctors, teachers, lawyers, insurance agents, funeral homeowners, salons, barbershops, restaurants, and abundance of other Black-owned businesses and successful self-sufficient towns 
all throughout the United States. As African Americans were pressing onward for economic success and a full acclimation and assimilation into American society, Prophet William S. Crowdy was pressing onward for spiritual survival and the ultimate elevation of a people to meet God and live a life that reflected such an intimate relationship. So in this decade, in 1896, when the prophet lived in Lawrence, Kansas, and organized the first tabernacle at Emporia and the second in Lawrence, the Church of God and Saints of Christ was formally established on November 8th, 1896. What a joy. Choir. All right, I got to play in the background a little bit there. Um, so, you feel like you're learning something, and this is a different kind of apologetics show here, where um, getting in some history. It's important to have an understanding of what we're dealing with, you know, when we, when we get into this. Now, I would like to see the average Christian urban apologist know more about the history of Hebrewism than the average Hebrewite, not because it saves us or anything like that, not to show off, but why? Because we can tell them what happened and explain the truth and show how um, it's very explainable. Oh, she's she's speaking again. Okay, I need to bring this. On. Uh, George, former Hebrews light says, Habawath Bathawada, which is happy birthday in the pure language. So in Lashawan Kodash, you say, Habawath Bathawada. But it seems like you would never say that right because they don't celebrate birthdays they say <laughs> so when would you ever be able to say hapawath bathawada but you know Crowley didn't hold a lashwan kudash but i still like the idea of saying hapawath bathawada hebrewism you know what bro next year when we do the 130th birthday we should say that i feel like we should be like hey hapawath bathawada i'm feeling it but anyways let's continue on here with this talk. Music is good, by the way. Can't front, right? I think they're six feet apart. I think that's what's happening. Some of these songs are about Crowdy. In fact, it looks like they have his picture up while they're singing. Prophet William S. Crowdy garnered the attention of all walks of life races, ethnicities, genders, and occupations. Good attention and much opposition, including cowboys in Texas who shot at him, a Jewish store owner in Texas, an Irish man on the streets of Chicago, and hundreds of people across the United States, moved and led by God to travel to various cities and towns, preaching the biblical Sabbath day, the Passover, the Hebrew calendar, day of atonement, and the 10 commandments. He was arrested some 22 times yet persisted to preach a message of empowerment, hope, purpose, and love. Love of God, love of self, and love of one another. So you say, St. Khadijah, I thought this was a love story. You're giving us a history lesson, but it is a love story. It's a love story of the efficacy of God's love in a contemporary day prophet. White newspapers referred to Prophet William S. Crowdy as the Black Elijah, yet he replied, I am not Elijah, but I come in the spirit and power of Elijah. The love of God is evidenced in the survival of William S. Crowdy to provide peace in the midst of a chaotic American world through a simple yet powerful message of love. Love of God, love of self, and love of one neighbors. This love message is seen in the Ten Commandments and is further highlighted in Jesus' summation found in Matthew 22, verses 70, 30 through 40. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We were in sin, but the prophet brought us the light. Choir. For the prophet, we were all in sin. We could not sing a song.
is a redemptive love story. How God took an enslaved man with limited formal education and Ah, I see I was muted. Apologies. Thank you, Michael, for bringing that out. Thank you. All I was saying is they're giving too much credit to man. Where they said we were in sin, but the prophet brought us out. The prophet gave us light. That's undue reverence for a man, even if he wasn't a false prophet. And it does seem like his rejection of Jesus, it appears he had. And uh, some of this, you know, lost gospel stuff, recovered stuff, it does entail false doctrine. But you shouldn't be, I mean, it's a little too much adulation for a person. But here you go, continue on. Sorry about the mute thing. We could not see the sword in a strange land, but we can find the God. We are servants of the Lord, and we are marching on to the By the way, I have it at 1.25 speed. So if you're wondering, oh, wait, why is it a little bit? I got it at 1.25 speed the whole time. Not myself, but them, just so you know. All right, continuing on here. This is a redemptive love story. How God took an enslaved man with limited formal education and told him to engage in acts that were unheard of in his day, to keep Saturday as the Sabbath and not Sunday, which in some states was even unlawful. He encouraged members to go into businesses for themselves. And if working for others, to give an honest day's work. He encouraged men and women to get legally married and if separated, to get legally divorced. He preached about helping others through charitable acts of kindness, love, outreach, and support, protection of women and men. William S. Crowdy was sent to redeem a people not only in America, but abroad as well. He sent men to Cuba and the West Indies and even the continent of Africa. He traveled from the West and Midwest across the U.S. setting up churches, converting hearts and souls, and saving lives arming God-fearing people with truth, justice, morality, and love. He established and bought businesses. He purchased land and empowered people who were considered three-fifths of a human to be 100% children of God, self-sufficient. He shared specifics in a precepts book that captured these life keys about repentance, baptism, the day which the Lord hath made, prayer, religion. He had a precept book? She just said he shared specifics in a precept book. Wow. That means essentially the concept of a precept packet, which we sometimes make fun of IUIC for, basically goes back to Crowdy. Wow. Listen to this. He traveled from the West and Midwest across the U.S. setting up churches, converting hearts and souls, and saving lives, arming God-fearing people with truth, justice, morality, and love. He established and bought businesses. He purchased land and empowered people who were considered three-fifths of a human to be 100% children of God, self-sufficient. He shared specifics in a precepts book that captured these life keys about repentance, baptism, the day which the Lord hath made, prayer, religion as a duty, dietary laws, why we should not be selfish, envious, or jealous of one another, and so much more. He lived during a time when African-American men and women did not have the right to vote. He lived during a time when African-American men and women did not have the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act, Affirmative Action, the ACLU, or the NAACP Legal Defense Fund to advocate for their humanity. But he did not need them because he had the Lord. Aren't you glad God sent his prophet while the days are going by? He brought the Ten Commandments while the days are going by. You, me, we. Our foreparents were in the dark and could not see. We couldn't see our worth. We couldn't see our divine connection to God. We could not see our potential. We could not see the God in each of us. And the prophet brought the light, the light of God's seventh day Sabbath, a consistent opportunity to stop and focus on God, to recharge, to reconnect to our great powers. We not need them because. That's what I'm saying. It doesn't have this element of we're going to enslave other nations, but the gospel of Hebrewism even in its best original, most uh, raw version, is you are very important. Now keep these laws. You're very significant. 
No, keep these commandments. Notice that. Hear that? Catch that? What? For real, George? George, why haven't you sent that to me yet? We still got to do that show, by the way, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, yeah, send me that, bro. You know I want that. So look, look at this. Listen to what... And it's a weird comment in there. We couldn't see the God in us. Okay. I would like to talk to this. I doubt she would want to talk to me, but I wish she would. I would let's let her speak. You know, I just want to hear what she has to say because she clearly has a lot of information and knowledge about this. And I would just want to interview her and just understand. I wouldn't try to. Maybe one day she would. He had the Lord. Aren't you glad God sent his prophet while the days are going by? He brought the Ten Commandments while the days are going by. You, me, we. Our foreparents were in the dark and could not see. We couldn't see our worth. We couldn't see our divine connection to God. We could not see our potential. We could not see the God in each of us. And the prophet brought the light, the light of God's seventh day Sabbath, a consistent opportunity to stop and focus on God, to recharge, to reconnect to our great power source. The seven keys, which represent divine ownership, sobriety, charity, purity, humility, supplication, love, and unconditional surrender to God, and of course, the Ten Commandments. Now, this is a man who was never formally educated, who told us to read the Bible daily and the newspaper. Is that not love? A man who encouraged us to go into business for ourselves. Is that not love? A man who told us to stay out of riots, to work honestly, to tell the truth if it takes your neck, not to gossip, to respect our elders and to have compassion for our children, to be neighborly to one another and to stand on your feet even when the world is on their head. Is that not love? That's love. It's God's love for us. And today, 124 years later, since the formal establishment of the Church of God and Saints of Christ, we exist because God so loved us that he blessed us, you and I, to pay attention, to take heed, and to embrace this salvific way of life. So when I think about this prophet, I do rejoice. I rejoice in love, peace, and hope. Choir. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. Isn't it though? Christopher Cunningham says, I hear much about good deeds and what we do, and little of God himself. Yeah. Well, I'm going to uh, see if there's one more section here. Um, I'm not going to play any more clips for today's show. But if you're just now coming on the tail end of this program, here's the deal. Hebrewism proper has been around for 129 years. The beginning began with William S. Crowdy. We just did a deep dive into some of the history there. But it was on this day, September 13th, that he's purported to have received a vision. And the vision included the reality that, hey, black Americans are the real Israelites. Now, there's um, more to be said about Crowdy and about Hebrewism since its inception 129 years ago. But let me read one last thing from the bio before I see if there's one other clip here. So, we're winding down. I hope you've learned a lot. And uh, I know I have. Let's see. That's not it yet. It is a redemptive love. Okay, this is fascinating because remember Deuteronomy 2868 says no one will buy them. They try to make it no one will redeem them. And by redeem, what they mean to try to say is no one will save them. And now they're going to get into that. Because basically they're going to say Crowley's the one who redeemed us. this redemptive love story and it is a redemptive love story because to redeem is to be free from distress to redeem is to be changed for the better to be redeemed is to repair restore and to retrieve prophet william saunders crowdy redeemed the people of his day by bringing back the ancient of days aligning us with abraham moses and jesus 
He connected us to the spirit of prophecy, attaching us to God and God's prophets who have continued uninterrupted even unto this day with our grand and noble leader, Chief Rabbi Philip E. McNeil, Grandfather Abraham. As I end this story of God's redemptive love, a redemptive love available to you and me, if we receive and live the testimony of Jesus and the ultimate love of God in the true and whole plan of salvation brought to us by Prophet William S. Crowdy, as stated in Revelation 19.10. Now, I could not tell you everything, but I will end here by sharing the words of this great man, William Saunders Crowdy, who in 12 short years reconnected us to God and brought us into one family. He said, little children, love ye one another and obey. Choir. Hmm. Okay. Now, I need to reiterate yet again. When you talk to Hebrews of Light, there is no guarantee that they know who Crowdy is. So this isn't about... The, the relationship with Crowdy and Hebrewism is not similar to Joseph Smith and Mormonism in the sense that you really can't be a Mormon and not know about Joseph Smith. The claims are too relevant, his claims of prophethood. Even though William S. Crowdy claimed to be a prophet... Because they claim the stuff is in the Bible, and a lot of the groups end up with their own prophets or priests, right? The relationship's not the same. You can be a Hebrews light and not have any idea who this guy is, even though there's no documented case. Any earlier in all of human history that we have recorded, that anyone ever said, hey, Peoples you think are of African descent are actually of Hebrew Israelite descent. Now, they're going to say, oh my gosh, well, God's a liar. They'll say, look, this right here says, and they'll point to their normal sources they point to. I'm talking about the explicit affirmation of this idea of, hey, you thought we were this, we're actually that. I don't mean the things you use for your apologetic evidences. I understand you think you have those. I'm talking about someone straight up saying it. Because the claim wasn't there. Now you look back and you try to retroactively find stuff, right, that you think lines up. <laughs> but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about someone making their claim, right? It doesn't exist until 129 years ago on this very day. Now let's read the rest of the bio, and maybe next year I'll read some more bios, okay, about him. Because there's multiple bios. This man came by himself, and he was without any assistance for some time. But he did not grow impatient, as he knew the word of the Lord must be fulfilled. As he continued to herald this doctrine on Broad Street, the eyes of many of his people were finally opened, and they began to surround him. In his public teachings, he declared that he came to reprove the world of sin, and he had started to establish the Church of God and Saints of Christ at Philadelphia, which is according to the Holy Bible, Revelation 8.17. And to the angel of the Church of Philadelphia write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth. And it was useless to prevail against him as he had been sent by God. The young believers said that he was only a puff of wind, and he would soon blow away. When he had gathered a few followers who believed in him, notice who they believe in here, by the way, he secured the old O'Neill Hall, Lombard Street near Broad, and for a long time they worshipped God in spirit and in truth in this place. The mode of worship and their customs soon aroused the people, and they gathered in multitudes to see and listen, and as he kept adding to the fold, this hall became too small to accommodate this increase so he secured the Quaker City Hall broad in Fitzwater Streets it was here that he began to open wide the eyes of the unbelievers by his wonderful accomplishments all oh, crowdy the membership of the church began to had grown rapidly, and as he saw wherein his people could be benefited in a business way, he had once opened up this avenue by shoveling a cash grocery store bearing the name of the church, and it proved a great success being patronized by the saints and also many of the outside world. His next ventures was the advent of a restaurant and cafe and a Noah's Ark Daughters of Jerusalem store where furnishings of all kinds were kept for men, women, and children. His next movement was also a very important one in the history of the church. This was the launching out of a printing office where he had in view 
through the publication of an official organ of the church, a mouthpiece, and he succeeded in his effort naming it the Weekly Prophet. It was not a paying investment that he looked for when he established it, but it was to help to further the interests of the true gospel to all. A barbershop was also added to the list of these business enterprises. This man brought all the above accomplishments forth in a few years of labor, and all of them were located on one street, which is Fitzwater, where the tabernacle is located. These wonderful achievements caused the outside world much worryment, and much has been said and written of them by both black and white journalists, some being complimentary and others full of criticism and ridicule. But in no way have they returned their progress, we can truly say that they have been made famous, and we are known to exist far and wide. While he was engaged in mixing business with the true gospel, he was not forsaking the doctrine, but he was installing in, in the minds of the masses the various phases of the seven keys, and also impressing upon their minds the things necessary for them to inherit eternal life. Other important duties that he said must be enforced was that you must be buried in baptism, and that wine must not be drank for Christ's blood. Many other teachings that have appeared in these columns he has taught, and he has ceased many of the mutterings of the learned ones. He was called the originator of the kissing bugs and foot washers, but none of these slang phrases have hurt him in any way in the least. During three years of existence at Philadelphia, he established a great many churches throughout the Southland and also in the East. The man who we have been writing about who was responsible for all these wonderful achievements was Prophet William S. Crowdy, Elijah in the Spirit. And that actually is from a website that they have apparently for a church in St. Thomas, Jamaica. Hmm. Fascinating. Michael's putting up some uh, some uh, stuff there. Thank you. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining me today.